Welcome to this week's episode of Lifts. Mo, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm actually here in Nashville, Tennessee at the Orange Theory Fitness Convention called Momentum. I think this is like the final day, so it's been a lot of excitement and having some really productive sessions. Very good. Well, we've got a we've got an interesting subject that's very, I guess, very timely and newsy. Hopefully, hopefully this goes out relatively close to when the information is available. But do you, do you want to um, make an introduction to our guest today, Mike? Yeah, I would. And, and what, what we're going to be talking about today is there's been a lot of news around the movements by L. Catterton and a couple of their funds going into some very notable companies and taking some, some active positions in them. So to help us unpack all things L. Catterton and current state of the funding industry, for the first time on Lyfts, it's a privilege to introduce Alex Ali Ministiano, who is a seasoned executive and angel investor with significant experience in the fitness and wellness industry. He served for a long time as CEO of Town Sports International. And in, in addition to his leadership at TSI, Alex has been an active investor in the fitness technology space, including investments in companies like Mirror, Ascensi, and others. Uh, he's been a leader in the industry. Um, Alex, I'm always you know, excited to have conversations with you when we connect typically at conferences. Um, you're currently calling in from your home in Jackson, Wyoming. Thank you for coming on to this episode of Lifts. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me and congratulations on your, what is it, a one year anniversary and 100,000 listeners. That's right, yeah. It, it seems like you started just yesterday, but that's, that's, uh, that's a great milestone. Well, well, well to, to be fair, to be fair, I, I just kind of showed up for the last, I think, 10,000. Scott and Matthew and team at Escape have been building their YouTube subscriber base, and I kind of latched onto the platform and we added lists to it. But really, the, the kudos goes to Matthew and the team over at Escape. Yeah, it's a great contribution to the the fitness ecosystem. I love it. Well, we're looking forward to the conversation today. One of the things that we were chatting about, Mo and I, before you joined Alex, was was Mirror. Uh, we we and we we I was I was kind of asking the question because I'm I'm not really an investor. Uh, Mo is, and and we were talking about you know what what kind of you know what what's the secret sauce in terms of picking something like Mirror? Is it a, is it is it kind of a really long in depth planned process you go through and to, to, to figure out that, you know, how that company was going to grow or in, in, in that particular case, was it, was there a little bit of luck be, uh, behind that particular one? Yeah, I, I would say there's always a big element of luck in a startup investment. Um, most, most startups don't succeed and um, to succeed, a lot of things need to, to go right. A couple of interesting things about Mirror. One, uh, I had met, and this, and this, you know, will will be relevant to the El Catterton discussion. In 2014, before El Catterton invested in Peloton, I met with them in uh, in their offices in Greenwich, and they were kind of coyly asking me about, you know, what I thought about home connected home. Home fitness, like, is that a thing that um, is, you know, how did I feel about it? How do I think about it? I, I come from the club world, so I'm, you know, a brick and mortar background, you know, community, people exercising together and getting out of the house. And, you know, so that was my bias. And so I gave them a sort of a, neg a negative view of, of what I thought about the um, the Peloton uh, opportunity, so uh, that pretty much disqualifies me as a you know as a as a great predictor of success, <laughs> of future success for startups. But you don't bat a thousand, right? So when when I saw what Peloton was uh, accomplishing over the next couple of years, not so much that they had had succeeded, but they were raising capital, they were getting into homes. Uh, they were, there was buzz about them, and uh, when when Bryn uh, Putnam from uh, who started the Mirror contacted me, and it was a believe it or not, it was a cold uh, email. It was it was not. Um, she knew that I was connected to the fitness world in New York City and 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 nationally, and and it was a you know really nice introductory email. Um, but anyway, it um, so. 
so I responded to it and I took a meeting. I saw what she had, you know, her, her prototype. And since I had sort of missed Peloton, you know, and I, and, and they were starting to get into the home, I, I reconsidered my opinion and said, well, okay, well, you know, maybe now with this, with where we are technologically, we can do something that is actually pretty good in the home, better than, you know, Nordic track or some, some uh, just sort of, uh, you know, a basic uh, fitness equipment. Um, and so that was the, that was the mirror story. And, and uh, you know, when you have another company that has pretty much shown that there's a market for some, a, a new market for something, and you can be, you know, jump onto it relatively quickly. So that was 2017 before the, you know, the huge kind of wave of investments in, in Home Connected. You know, that's a pretty, that's a pretty nice setup. And, and I typically think that to your point that the second player coming in is still relatively early. So you had the first player kind of breaking open an industry and, and validating maybe a concept that could be new. And right. this is not something that is uh, unique to fitness. You've seen it even, even in EVs, right? Tesla comes out, has his massive, massive success. And you see, you know, Fisker and Rivian and Luce and these other ones. And, but, but, but there's at some point where the follow on companies each time try to go after and higher and higher valuation, because now the price of entry into this new industry that was created is even higher. So you need to get a bigger raise at a, at a, at a more, you know, ridiculous valuation. So I think mirror probably when you came in, I'm curious to know if you're okay to disclose it, but when you came in, what was the valuation of mirror? When you uh, so in? I was an angel, I was an angel investor. They had not raised any seed money. Wow. Um, so you came on very early. It was sub, yeah, it was sub 10 million. Which is, which is a really good time to be able to, uh, to able to be able to identify that particular time. But then you look on the follow on ones, you know, that, that came after Mira, whether it's Honol or Hydra or others, you're always coming in at a higher number. So the key I've, I've always found is to identify either the first or second player, maybe even third in some cases, but then you see this excitement kind of build up for the fourth and fifth iterations of, of concepts. And typically you don't see the same outcomes at the first or second mover advantage. Um, might be a good time to transition into the first kind of key story that we want to talk about. El Catterton, Alex, that you mentioned, has always been, I think, an active investor on the private equity side. And for a lot of people who are listening in that might not be familiar with El Catterton, El Catterton is largely backed by the LV. MH group, and that's the not not the only source, but it's certainly a primary source of their funding. They they have been an active PE firm in um, in consumer goods um, through a couple of different funds, but they have a growth fund and a venture fund, and I want to get into that here in a minute. But over the last decade, they've actually been one of the most active PE and overall investors in our category. Yeah. Which has been really interesting, and I think when we talk about the, the the two moves that they made last week, they've now by far become the most active PE firm in the industry. But to kick things off, Matthew, do you want to introduce the Egym Al Catterton story? Yeah, I do. Essentially, Egym secures two hundred million of growth capital led by Al Catterton to continue building a leading global platform at the intersection of uh, fitness and health tech, and. This, uh, Mun, Mun and I have had a number of conversations about it and be, you know, really, really interested to get your views. But it, it, it's, uh, I, I think now that the valuation of the company is around about a billion dollars, which, which is, um, you know, pretty much a company that, that seemingly has come out of nowhere and, and has a lot of people very excited about it. And when I look, when I was, you know, when, when we were discussing the company, it very much seems as though on one side, it's, uh, it has a strength circuit so so some strength equipment and then there's a technology component to it and um I, you know i've been asking around myself you know what 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 was it about that certainly there's nothing new about connected strength or or strength circuit you know technology got a version and there's even been versions i believe that have been around for quite a number of years that operate in a similar way from a product perspective but but clearly there's some secret source in there so you know what what do you think it is about the egm product that that has investors uh particularly interested in uh in the organization at the moment 
You know, I've been in the industry a long time now, probably close to 40 years. I remember Life Fitness back in the 90s had the Life Circuit. And uh, so it was Connected Strength, Smart Strength. And there was FitLinks that came along at some point and, and was making, you know, weight stack machines of smart uh, connecting those to technology and, and uh, so you could track and program. And so it's, it's been, you know, 30 years, right? Close, close to 30 years, probably. Uh, the bio circuit as well be, before the recent one, I think that, that, that came just like just a little bit after the life circuit as well, which was like a, I don't if you remember, it was like quite a big chunky machine yeah. that they had. Yeah. So, so, uh, so I'm a little skeptical, I mean, as an old guard guy, I'm a little skeptical of the electromagnetic strength equipment for for a lot of people. But um, I think what Catterton and Meritech see is uh, that there's adoption in in the gyms. Um, they're they're in thousands of gyms already. Um, I'm sure they looked at engagement and and usage in in the in the YMCAs and and in Europe and you know I don't I'm not privy to that information but they must believe that the time is right for smart strength. Well, well we've had Philip on, who's the the, the co-founder and CEO of eGym on this podcast. Um, I think a couple of months ago when we were at the URSA or the Health and Fitness Association conference and. We also partner with eGym, so I, I kind of get to see them from both like the outside and the inside perspective as well. I've had an opportunity to to work with the eGym team, and and something that that I've seen, I think Alex, you're absolutely right. They definitely have had penetration in the U.S. predominantly in in, in Wise. They also have, I think, a, a successful partnership with EOS, which is a high value, low price, fast growing chain here in the U.S. They're also very successful in the German market. Uh, at the, in the commercial clubs and German market, but that's just on the equipment side. And, and I wonder if the valuation here. So the 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 most recent raise is two hundred million at a billion dollar valuation. Has more to do with the software and AI side of what they're doing. So each of them also has this platform, almost like an OS that runs on top of a club's member management system. That's number one. They also have a white labeled version of, of, of a mobile app that they have developed since acquiring NetPulse a few years ago. That's the second one. And then and I think third uh, on the value chain is they, they launched early this year an AI tool called Genius, which now because they're in a lot of clubs, uh, they continue to develop and Genius continues to learn more from data points that they're collecting. And from an integration perspective, and this could be maybe even a fourth tech value uh, proposition, is that they've built, and I'm putting this in quotes, but an open ecosystem where they have hundreds of partners that integrated on Cardi equipment. For instance, when we launched um, the Virtual Bike for Core about a year and a half ago, we integrated eGyms authentication and five-star program into that product. And a lot of commercial products now have this eGym integration in it. So it's hard to really kind of view them as purely as an equipment company with the motorized kind of strength um, component to it. This valuation to me seems like El Catterton is viewing them more as a technology or SaaS company and betting that over the next few years, they're going to collect more data about members and about gyms than anyone else who's well positioned in the market today. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, I I always get a little skeptical of companies that are that seem like hardware companies but call themselves tech companies or content companies or entertainment companies or so that's just my you know my my kind of you know bias I guess about about how they how how they present it but but I do think that you know there are other companies out there that have really strong corporate type businesses and technology systems like like Jim Pass. I don't know a lot about Jim Pass, but you know, their valuation was over 2 billion. Um, they're serving, you know, corporate wellness clients. They don't have the hardware, but I'm sure they're, you know, their their software and and uh, technology is very compelling. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I've seen Catterton invest in iFit 
for example, and hydro and tonal. And so they've, they've made a bunch of, of equipment technology type investments. Have those worked out? I mean, Peloton certainly has, but do, do, we, do they have success on those other ones? You know, time will tell, right? The wait is over. Our new Escape Fitness catalog has landed. This is the essential guide to all of the latest product innovations that are shaping the future of functional training. Bigger and better than ever, this year's catalogue is 190 pages, jam-packed with everything from eye-catching, bespoke functional training frames to some of the latest strength training equipment. So sign up today to receive the digital version today. So what are you waiting for? Go to escapefitness.com now. Now, that's a really good point. So, I mean, I always look at comparables in other industries when we're looking at valuations in our own. I'm going to pull up this number, which I just... Um, Pulled out for Tesla. Tesla uh, currently has a market capitalization around 824 billion, which is the, making it the most valuable automobile company in the world by a large number. You consider that the other leading car companies, Toyota and Volkswagen, each have you know one 230 billion, and um, Volkswagen at 100 billion. So you're talking about Tesla, which is being valued at a different multiple than how other things looked at. You know. It almost seems like eGym is being valued more like a Tesla than it is being more valued compared to like a techno gym or a life fitness. Yeah. I mean, techno gym's value is a couple billion dollars last time I looked. So that's right. And, and they have e almost a billion. E is, is worth half of what, what techno is worth. But when, when techno's revenue is nearly or maybe even over a billion dollars, right? What's the, do you, do you, know, do you know the revenue of, of eGym? Anyone? No. no. They have I, I do not. <laughs> no. I, what do you know about WellPass? I, I was chatting to someone earlier and, uh, about this because apparently that is is a big competitive advantage. And I'm not sure whether WellPass is similar to what GymPass is, um, but there, there certainly seems from from what I've been told, there's, there's, a, there's this connection with that and being able to understand the... The, the the client journey and be able to make recommendations and integrate from more from a medical perspective. Um, does anyone know anything about about those products? Well, WellPass, as Alex mentioned about Gym Pass, I think it's called Well Hub now. Um, is pretty much just that. It is, it is a corporate wellness platform. To be honest, Matthew, I did not know anything about it um, until each required them. So it looks like Egem acquired a company um, relatively, you know, in its infancy. Um, according to this article, it looks like it had 2.5 million users of, on, on WellPass. I'm sure the WellPass acquisition had a lot to do with this funding round, which has recently happened as well. But Egem is, is trying to build an ecosystem and to Alex's point, move them away from a hardware company and, and really be looked at more as a software SaaS technology company. Alex, what what do you when you look at this from you you you've been around the industry for quite some time, operated clubs, purchased lots of equipment, I'm sure. Where where do you see the equipment market and and you know what what do you what what how would you look at that from a, a competitor's perspective? Because you have got uh Technogym, I believe they've got a similar product to, to EGM and and then there's Life Fitness um, in there, which which I guess at the moment doesn't and Matrix that are probably looking at this. So what what do you, you know, with obviously they have a much broader offering, uh, whereas EGM is just essentially a strength company, but with other benefits that we've we've spoken about. You know, what, what do you what do you look at as when you looked at your number two of Peloton being mirror, what what would you look for uh, whether you're sort of inside a company or as an outsider for for the number two to to, to the e gym that's clearly the, the the main player in that space at the moment. Well, I was going to say, Matthew, the I don't know the price point that e gym is at. I don't know if if you do. I couldn't really find that in publicly available. But I was going to say the 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 general buying pattern seems to have changed in clubs from and with the reduction in in cardio equipment purchases, and so maybe that's another you know, a, a good timing, a point for for eGym that since the clubs are spending less money on cardio, they have a little bit more money for strength and, and maybe they're willing to try a more innovative, more tech forward 
uh, concept right now. Uh, I was just you know, putting on my buyer's hat and saying, okay, if this equipment is double or triple what a plate loaded equipment costs, who, you know, how are they going to justify, how are the clubs going to justify buying it? Um, in terms of a number two, you know, I'm not that close to to where the R&D is at, at the manufacturers these days. I hear Precore is is kind of, you know, coming out with some interesting products and and maybe, maybe Precore. I, I, uh, I think Techno is, you know, is, is, is doing a great job generally. Uh, they've been trying to, you know, break into the, the smart strength category for years. And I don't know if they've made much of a much headway there. I guess with, with, with 200 million, I would have thought you could make some really interesting headway, particularly if you're already in that space with a, with a customer base, you know, it, it, it does seem like a lot of money, um, more than, you know, some of the strength companies are turning over, you know? Yeah, it's a lot of money. And, and it's funny the the CEO keeps saying, you know, we didn't need the money and, and I just wanted the investors, which is a kind of an odd thing to hear, you know, cause you, you take 200 million, you dilute everybody. Why, why do that just to have access to El Catterton and Meritech? I don't, I don't really get it. And this comes after too, just, just to be clear, they raised in 2023, around by with affinity equity partners um, as well. And then they raised, that's a series F. Uh, and then in 2021, they raised 41 million in a series E round from Mayfair, Highland, Europe, and, and, and others. So they've been raising, they raised in 2021, in E, 2023 with the series F, and now a series G. So they, they're continuing to raise capital. And to your point, Alex, that's right, they do. It, it would kind of push everybody else down. But this is not El Catterton's only investment. And, and we want to also talk about El Catterton's second investment, which was also announced last week um, with Solid Core. So, Matthew. El Catterton acquire a majority stake in Solid Core um, that will leverage El Catterton's deep fitness industry expertise and brand building capabilities to help build the company further and strengthen its industry's leading position. So curious to know, you know, are there, are there any similarities between the, the two deals uh, that, that they've done in terms of the the, uh, the position that these companies are, are in? Uh, we, we talked earlier, we talked a moment ago about EGM and the fact that they didn't really need the money. Um, what, what, what's the situation with, with, with solid core in relation to this investment? Uh, how, how, how are they performing? And 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 you know, in some ways, from what I hear, it's a slightly different model, uh, smaller footprint, uh, less cost to build, and um, probably at a time where some of the boutique studios, particularly some of the hit-based ones, have been through an interest. Hit ones and and cycling studios have been through quite an interesting time. Many of them have have, have not survived. So th this this company coming out um, and and you know getting. A lot of uh, interest and investment is is quite um, you know it's quite a positive thing. So so curious to understand you know what 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 are some of the dynamics behind that that business model that makes it uh, seemingly quite appealing. Well, well, I think for one for those in the audience who have not heard of, of of Solid Core, which would be kind of hard because you'd have to literally be living under a rock or not be in the United States to be to not know about Solid Core, uh, but. I, I live in the DC area and I think this is one of the very proud fitness success stories amongst others. We have others as well to come out of the DC area, but Solid Core was founded in 2013 by Anne Mulhoom. And um, initially, you know, she had just taken out some loans and opened up a couple of studios, which are really Pilates focused. They've kind of taken a modern twist on a Pilates format, even though a purist Pilates instructor, I, I assume, would not view Southcore as being a pure Pilates format. They've gotten a series of minority investments, including from V&G Partners in 2021. But to your point, Matthew, in this most recent raise, the dynamics behind this, not raise, this really acquisition is very different than Egem. So Egem was an investment. Here, El Catterton acquired a majority stake in Solid Core which values a company between 600 and 700 million. There's a lot of reasons why I believe they made this acquisition. First being that Pilates is something that we talk about a lot on this podcast. It's what a lot of people have been talking about. There are many Pilates studios and connected stuff and mat-based Pilates, floor-based Pilates 
formats out there. Les Mills this year introduced a Pilates-based product. Uh, obviously, Club Pilates is the core brand behind Exponential Fitness. You're seeing other Pilates formats like Strong Pilates, uh, Your Reformer, um, Reform RX, and the Connected. This is Pilates seems to be everywhere. But when you're looking at the unit economics of a physical corporate owned, uh, non-franchise owned like Club Pilates studio that is growing the fastest in, in North America, it is solid core. They have over a hundred locations. They are highly effective. I mean, the solid core in my neighborhood, I believe the first class is at 4.30 in the morning. It, it's, it's kind of ridiculous and goes until late at night. It's constantly booked and waitlisted. An incredibly efficient model where the instructor checks you in, locks the door, runs the class, comes out, does it all over again for the next class. So you don't need a lot of staff to run it. When real estate is expensive, it's a very effective kind of leasing model where you don't need a lot of square footage. I believe it's around 2,000 square feet, as, as you mentioned. And it's effective. Unfortunately, I actually probably injured myself going a little bit too <laughs> hardcore. We were talking about this early today. I, 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 I pulled... Uh, a lower abdominal muscle in solid core about a week and a half ago. Not a fault of solid core. This is more about Mo trying to do too much in something I don't do a lot of. So now I'm slightly injured from doing solid core. But it's, it, yeah, I'll tell you, when I was in the class, I felt great. Um, I was absolutely feeling it. Uh, in some ways, I'm still feeling it right now. But I think that's why El Caterton got in. It just kind of fit well into their portfolio. Uh, and now they have a majority stake. But, but Alex, I mean, you've yep. won physical clubs at scale would love to get your perspective on this acquisition yeah so i'm seeing some parallels with uh soul cycle and you know the pilates is at at a very high level i was going to say it's at the peak but in terms of demand <laughs> but but you never know where the peak is um but pilates is just on fire i mean that's where the the most demand is i would say in in boutique and we've seen what's happened to cycling it's it's plateaued and come down and and soul cycles closed a lot of clubs and flywheels gone out of business and and uh, cycle, cycle bar, bar it's also not doing well right right cycle bar is probably the the weakest brand in the exponent, or one of the weakest in terms of closures in the, in the exponential portfolio. So I, I I'm a little you know skeptical again about standalone boutiques that only do one thing. And so it could be Soul Cycle, you know, it could be Varies, it could be you know Solid Core. Just in terms of fundamental business principles, the the barriers to entry are just are quite low and and there are a lot of opportunities to compete with solid core and you know when people see when people see the 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 amount of margin that they're making you know people will open a couple blocks away and and that's just the nature of the beast so uh, you know it it may be that that there's room to run and there's plenty of you know there's five more years or or you know whatever period of time of growth that remains in the demand. Um, and there'll be enough, you know, to feed everybody. But at some point when a business is, has low barriers to entry, I know you could talk about the brand and the brand appeal and the power of the brand and all that, but SoulCycle had as much brand appeal and power as, as any boutique ever probably so to me the you know this is one or two private equity firms selling to another private equity firm after the founder sold um so to me you know i, I i'm a little i guess i I'm, I'm a little nervous about you know the sector and you know that being said that that that's a little negative on the positive side, you know, to sell a boutique uh, fitness studio concept for 650 million or whatever it was with 130 units at 5 million a unit, uh, 13 times EBITDA to a really smart investor is a uh, is something to be celebrated for our, for the industry. So. Do those guys, um, does El Catterton own Barry's? Uh, North Castle owns Barry's. 
and Barry's, oh, okay. you know, apparently has been on the market. It, it's interesting that you made the comparison to SoulCycle. SoulCycle did not have as many kind of rounds of investment. The, the first one that, that, that they had was in 2011. Equinox acquired a majority stake or, or just a little bit above that for 50% uh, fifty just only for around $25 million. And uh, again, it, it is reported that they they then um, bought bought it completely in 2015 from the founders where uh, I believe they each, uh, again, reportedly uh, cashed out at about 90 million each for Julia and Elizabeth. So that's 180 million on top of the of, on top of the initial investment. And that was in 2015. Now we're, we're nine years later, and it appears like you know soul cycle maybe has peaked or, or cycling as a modality has peaked. And interesting that you kind of made that comparison, which I didn't think about to to solid core. And maybe it's because the modalities are different, the unit economics are different. Soul cycle obviously can you know hold anywhere from 50 bikes to 70 bikes. And I just think a room when you walk into solid core could feel fuller with just 20 beds in it, right? Instead of having, if you had 20 people in a soul cycle class, it feels kind of empty. Having 20 people in a solid core, having 15 people in that class is going to feel full. So you still kind of have that community kind of feel and environment. But you're right. I mean, Anne Maloum cashed out, a, again, reportedly made about 100 million or so from solid core initially. And, and now El Caterton has this majority stake. They're expecting to open... 250 studios by, I believe it is 2028. And I'm curious, Alex, just to get your perspective on this, you know, for instance, I'm here at the Orange Theory Fitness Convention. They have struggled to scale internationally, which is a which is one key reason why they merged with self-esteem brands is to help on the international growth. Many boutique brands have kind of struggled to take, to, re- to replicate the model and the unit economics from the U.S. to international, SolidCore might have to do that to achieve their goal of 250 by 2028. Do you think that the modality can grow internationally? I think it can. I I don't know if it can grow beyond some obvious places like London, for example. I, I just, you know, I, I, I don't know the demand for Pilates in France and Germany and Italy and and uh, in the, you know, in, in, in Asia, but I guess you could look or, you know, we'd have to look at what Club Pilates is doing in, in those, do they have, do they have strong franchisees in those markets? And if, if so, then I don't see why Solid Core couldn't. Um, I think Barry's has been somewhat successful growing internationally, but, but you're right. It's, it's, uh, it's not, not obvious. Uh, to get to 250 in the United States, not that hard. At, you know, that's- well, well, no one, no one's achieved over 200 corporate. I don't think anyone's achieved 100 corporate-owned boutique studios. I mean, that we've seen that growth happen in big box gyms. You know, like Lifetime, obviously Planet Crunch, and others. But, um, but from a corporate-owned perspective, Lifetime has certainly been on the big box side. Um, but I don't believe any boutique studio has achieved over 150 corporate owned locations. Is that, is that, would that be part, like you mentioned earlier, Alex, about, um, you know, barriers to entry and, and a lot the, 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 I guess the main competitor is uh, club Pilates, which is franchise from exponential. Like do, do you outside of the, the, I guess, the, the the fact that it that it is fairly easy for anybody to open up a studio across the road because of the the low cost as an example like are there any other things that you would see that would give them a point of difference or make it difficult to compete with them and would the fact that they're corporate owned as opposed to franchise give them you know at, at, at least a little bit more of an advantage uh, over maybe a single operator that that's that's trying to sort of open up down the street? yeah I think people like the franchise model in boutique because uh, you can go really fast and when the barriers to entry are pretty low you want to get to the a plus locations before anybody else and the best way to do that is with you know an army of franchisees opening units my my view matthew is you can differentiate somewhat what you're doing in boutique but not to the point where uh, a, a really good competitor can 
steal you know enough of your business so that your business is a marginally profitable versus extremely profitable um i just I, I, you know i use the soul cycle example it's it's too easy to open a flywheel you know two blocks away and it's not that it's gonna kill your business uh, but it it does you know it, it goes from being a great business to an okay business and 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 that, you know, the margins go down. And so I, I don't think, you know, I, but I could be missing something. Maybe they have a reformer that is just different and so much better and, and patented. And, <laughs> you know, it's got springs that nobody else has. Or I, You know, I can't imagine that, that one reformer versus another is going to make that big a difference to the point where you... Um, you have a, a sustainable competitive advantage for years and years and years. Well, Alex, I think we're, we're almost at time. And one yeah. of the things that we'd like to wrap up on is final thoughts and, and takeaways. Uh, so I would like to start with you first and to see, you know, based off of what El Catterton has done, some of the moves that they've done, does this open up a new time or, or like a time of growth again of investment capital coming back into the industry? Or is this more El Catterton? diving deeper into what they already know well? That's a great question because El Catterton doing things alone isn't going to create a wave of, of new capital in, into uh, early stage or growth uh, fitness investments. But I think that there is, you know, there's a herd mentality in, in, in the PE world. <laughs> it's just... So if people are looking around and they're sitting on billions of dollars and they're they're saying, oh, we wrote off the fitness industry when Peloton went from 170 to three dollars a share, and now El Catterton, you know, who's got 35 billion dollars of assets under management, is jumping back in. It's like Blackstone, you know, jumping back into the real estate market. It's like, okay, well, it, it's not obvious yet, but. They see things, so let's start looking. Matthew, any any final thoughts from you? Yeah, similar to that last question. I I think you know clearly these guys, these there's 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 some smart people there. Even though that doesn't necessarily mean that they always make great decisions, but but there's certainly some smart people looking at the space. What what we didn't get time to talk about was uh, which I was curious to know is you know is is the is the commercial fitness space undervalued at the moment and you know is this from from their side you know an opportunity to to get in um at a at a you know a good price and as the market turns upward which is you know i think at the moment it's 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 certainly um at a, at a pretty low point in general if you look at it in broad terms then you know are they buying in at a, at a low point do they see that things are going to increase, and you know, is is this a good signal for the for the future of the industry? I think I think those are the questions that probably we, we, we can continue to to talk about. But that that that's probably what I'm I'm taking away, and maybe maybe sort of hopeful is is uh, is what they're. Saying. Well, I, I think I, I agree with with both of you. I'm always a little bit cautious, Alex, when I'm looking at this because one, I I, I personally you know have made investments in companies because you see someone else do it, and you think that they know more than you when they might know more than you in a particular business it doesn't mean they know more than you in a particular modality or category so i think that was important to say are they investing in the business are they investing in the founder or are they investing in the modality and, and i think that's one for other investors to to pay attention to however however it's always exciting to see growth and investment and these positive stories come into the industry when we've had the last couple of years of just really tough times and a lot of companies in the connective space and the physical space going out of business and really coming out of it. So this is, to me, incredibly encouraging. Um, I am excited to see El Catterton kind of go even deeper into the category. I think it's a good thing when you've got, you know, one or two large companies really not just go all in on one, but but they've been investing in Hydro, Peloton, Tono, iFit, um, now SolidCore, Egypt. It's just, it's just adding to the growing portfolio, which means that there's going to be more data, more insights for which they could then action upon. I do think, though, it is going to probably reprice a lot of other boutique businesses. I'd be curious to know where Barry's lands based off of what some of the economics that 
uh, Solid Core has just acted for. And same with EJ Matty, back to the commercial conversation, you know, those commercial companies that then have a technology component, are they going to be priced more on, as a tech company rather than just a hardware company? Um, does that mean we have to rethink Technogyps valuation, which is a public traded company? So lots of questions, a lot of excitement, but Alex, it's been a pleasure to have you on and thank you so much for sharing your insights. Oh no, thank you. Um, um, I love what you guys are doing and uh, you, you keep your ear on the track and you have a lot of insights on what's going on. So it's great to have this conversation. Well, thanks very much, Alex, for joining us. And um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have any comments or anything to say, then you can go to the Lyfts page on, on LinkedIn. And if, if you enjoyed this episode, then please help us to get it out to more people by, by sharing it to, with a couple of people you know. So thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.